and I am your host of the Just a Freedom radio show. And you can find out more about me at black365.com. There you will find a host of culturally relevant educational products. Again, my name is Jamal Brown, and tonight we will be discussing uh, a myriad of topics in Black history. We're going to be focusing on the Reconstruction era, some of the uh, dark days, as well as some of the bright days that took place during the Reconstruction era. Let's first off build on where we were at with our with one of our previous um, shows, and also we're going to give you a, a highlight or a preview of some things that are to come. Share my screen right now. And uh, here we are. Uh, we, in a previous show, talked about Cleopatra's needle, uh, also known as an obelisk. This, these images that you're seeing right now, I think you're seeing, yeah, yeah that you're seeing right now on my screen, are actual African, actual Egyptian monuments created in Egypt thousands of years ago. However, the current home of these objects is not in Africa. Each one of these obelisks were stolen from Africa and now reside in the hands of European people. Uh, one of them uh, resides in London, uh, another of them resides in Paris, and another one resides right here in these United States, not in Central Park of, of all places. Central Park is the home of one of these obelisks. An obelisk is an ancient Egyptian symbol of resurrection. It is a symbol of power, it is a symbol, symbol of uh, establishment, it is a symbol of this is where great things are taking place. And in a previous show, we talked about how um, the United States got their hands on one of these. It was given as a gift from a politician in Egypt and was taken to uh, New York. We here at the Just the, uh, Just the Freedom Radio Show I obviously have a problem with that. We, have, we talk about the appropriation or misappropriation or flat out stealing of African things and why these things take place uh, by people who claim that they have a, a distrust or dislike or displeasure with the things that are African, yet we see the stealing of African things. I always like to say that African people are the mothers and fathers of civilization. The world's first doctors, first lawyers, first politicians, first mathematicians, we created the world's first universities where people came from all around the globe to study our information. And when they returned to their home, they claimed our information as their own. Thus began the theft of African philosophy, followed by the theft of African spirituality, culminating in the ultimate theft, that being the theft, theft of African people and African things. Um, oh man, that's a mouthful. I know I said a mouthful, but again, let's, we, we've seen some highlights of that uh, throughout time. And let me tell you, there was one African country that did not have to suffer at the hands of colonialism. I'm not sure, our callers out there can correct me if I'm wrong, but you will not see too many things from one country around the world. Because of all of our fabulous countries in Africa, there was one country that was never colonized. A question for you out there, a trivia question. What country is that? That's the country of Ethiopia, of Ethiopia. That's right. No flag other than the Ethiopian flag has ever flown over the great country of Ethiopia. It was never colonized, not one time. Uh, there were, there were, there's lore and legend and stories about how the Ethiopian people would fight valiantly, how they would collectively come together and pray. And they, I, I've read that when they prayed, they would pray that, as the Italians who were attempting to colonize them uh, were dropping bombs and dropping missiles with their superior technology, they would pray for a great wind to come. And there was times where it's been documented that a great wind would come. And as those missiles were falling, the great wind would rush and sway those bombs and missiles and land them in abandoned areas and desolate areas as opposed to more populated targets. And many times, many of those missiles went undetonated. You don't believe me? Here's a photo. Here's a photo, uh, I can't do anything but smile each and every time I see this photo here taken in Ethiopia. In the center of the photo, we have uh, Haile Selassie. Uh, some people call him uh, the, the king or uh, emperor, uh, Haile Selassie. We see him standing with his foot atop an undetonated Italian missile dropped from an airplane. That's right, an undetonated Italian missile 
dropped from an airplane were standing upon it. So again, the, uh, we, we always like to acknowledge the great people of Ethiopia who have done great and wonderful things and held their ground, saw the colonists, those looking to colonize them and say, you know what, we're not going to allow that to happen and stood strong and didn't allow colonization to take place. But we said at the top of this, again, African people are the mothers and fathers of civilization, world's first doctors, first lawyers, first politicians, first mathematicians, first to create institutions of higher learning. And people came and stole the precious jewels of Africa, the artifacts of Africa, the statues of Africa. And again, the most precious jewel, that being African people. But we at the Gist of Freedom Radio don't like to talk about what some would like to term or some would like to have you think uh, that we were happy slaves, that we just kind of went along with the program. No, that was not the case. There were African people who were forced to march from the interior of Africa to the dungeons on the coast. But during that trek, there were people who fought, people who struggled, people who gave their life, people who took lives in attempt to preserve life and preserve the way of life and preserve the empires and preserve the dynasties and preserve the riches of Africa. Here's a, a photo, again, showing that forced migration from the interior of Africa to the slave dungeons, the dungeons where they kept enslaved Africans on the coast. There were Africans who fought along that trek. There were Africans who fought in those dungeons. There were valiant warriors, both men, women, and children who fought on the boat rides during the transatlantic slave trade. There are African people who fought on the plantation. We constantly fought. And struggle took many, many forms. Uh, I was having a conversation with a great scholar sure, uh, earlier today, and we, just, we were discussing some of those forms in which struggle, which opposition took place and how it looked. There were times when African people would intentionally break their tools, break their uh, 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 instruments of work, say it was a hoe or an ax or something of that nature, a hammer, again, it, it would oftentimes go missing or be broken. African individuals oftentimes intentionally worked slowly to sort of slow down the pace of enslavement. African people, as we know, ran away. We know that they fought, again, just like on those ships, they took lives and gave their lives in the struggle for freedom. Poison, there were many herb herbalists who knew how to uh, go into the forest and get different herbs that caused the overseers to become sick. Uh, uh, there's so many stories of African struggle on those plantations. But we had a, a full and robust life. Again, oftentimes in the films, we see simply uh, the images of happy slaves, images of docile enslaved individuals and, and what have you, but that, that wasn't the case. Here's an image, popular image of life on a plantation. Again, there were times where we had an enduring spirit. We had an enduring personality. Our love of the creator, our focus on family, our focus on the future, our focus on spirituality was maintained. And so uh, some of the things we did well, we did come up with songs. We did come up with dances. I'm going to take a look at a few other images here. One thing that we did, we, uh, we got married. That's right. The tradition of jumping the broom, um, the tradition of escaping and, and having that nucleus, having that family is a, uh, a fact, something that we did uh, without a doubt during the time of enslavement. Um, Here's a book, uh, Bound in Wedlock, Slave and Free Marriages in the 19th Century. Again, I've read um, stories and testimonials of individuals who were separated during the horrors of enslavement after the Civil War, traveling across states. I read a story of a brother who lived uh, in Texas and he walked to Arkansas looking for his wife. When he found her, uh, she had, uh, her health had uh, um, gone down, and he literally carried her in a pot. You, you heard me right. Carried her in a pot to Georgia, where they had some other family members. So again, a brother was in Texas, went to Arkansas, 
found his wife after the Civil War, put her in a pot and carried her in a pot. Again, the enduring love, the enduring affection, the enduring uh, um, desire for family is something that was undying amongst many of our brothers and sisters during enslavement. We're gonna go ahead and keep it moving here. But again, we, we read, we learned how to read in, in, with the possible possibility of death. With the possibility of death being an option for being caught with a book, having your foot cut off was something that sometimes took place for individuals looking to read. But knowledge, wisdom, information is something that we constantly sought, constantly pushed forward, pushed for, pushed for and constantly uh, pursued during, in, uh, during enslavement. And so it, 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 burns my, it burns me up inside when I hear people, particularly young people talk about, I don't like to, I don't like to read or, you know, I've heard people, you know, we, we, we've heard it in our community that, you know, uh, being smart, uh, getting good grades is something that, you know, that's, that's, that's acting white. I always like to say, don't you know that under the scepter of death, uh, of pain, of punishment, our folks stole away, stole away, found a way to become educated, learn how to read in the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of information is something that has always, always been something that we've done. Another thing that we did, we constantly found ways to gather and practice spirituality and religion. There are places called hush harbors. We like to call them invisible institutions. These were religious gatherings of enslaved Africans who would meet in the marsh, meet in the swamplands, meet out back. Again, it wasn't authorized. Uh, 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 punishment, if caught, was certain. But still, our constant need, our constant desire to have communal relationships, to praise in the way that we praise, to dance in the way that we dance, to sing, to cry, to shout, to stop in the way that we did was something that was an insatiable urge, something that we risked life and limb to pursue. Again, you're listening to the Gist of Freedom radio show. BlackHistoryUniversity.com is how this station is powered. Again, it's on Blog Talk. And I am your host, Jamal Brown. Some call me Professor Jamal. Others call me Mr. Black365. Black365.com is where you can find out more about me. Again, we're looking at some more images here of these hollowed institutions, of these hush institutions, of these places of refuge where we came under the darkness of night, under the feet, uh, under the certain um, reprisal of punishment. We came and we gathered, and we prayed, we came, we gathered, we married, we came, we gathered, we baptized our youth and ourselves. And we did this again, knowing that our bodies might be in, in, in shackles, but our minds, our souls, our spirits would always, always be free. In uh, 1804, that date may ring a bell for some of you. 1804, that is the year that Haiti became the first place on the planet Earth where formerly enslaved people, formerly enslaved Africans or formerly enslaved people of any kind took back their freedom by force. That's right, took back their freedom by force. I believe the year was 1791 when a number of Africans in Haiti met in an alligator swamp. That's right, I can't think of no more, dare I say, bold, dare I say, yeah, what I'm trying to say is you had to be a bold somebody. You had to be a determined somebody. You had to be a fearless somebody to meet in the dark, in the wet, in the swamp, filled with alligators. This is how much we valued, how much we sought, how much we fought for freedom. Again, I believe it was the year of 1791 in Haiti, Africans met in one of these hush institutions in the swamps. They devised a plan, they selected some leaders and put forth the plan, put forth the mission that came to fruition. January 1st, 1804 is when 
Haitian Revolution concluded and the Declaration of Independence for Haiti took place. Again, we constantly sought to be a communal people, sought to preserve life and thrive. After the period we know as enslavement came the period of Reconstruction. And I got to tell you, these people during Reconstruction are some of the most baddest Black folks. Strike that. The most baddest folks that you will ever see, hear, read about, period. Hands down, anywhere else on the planet. Do you know that just a few short years out of enslavement, I'm talking about physical enslavement, enslavement of the bodies where we were forced to pick cotton, forced to pick indigo, forced to pick tobacco, forced to be the engine that allowed this country to garner or to generate the amount of revenue, the amount of surplus, the amount of dollars that it still lives off of today. A few short years after that, period known as Reconstruction, African people were the most baddest people on the planet. We had, we created banks just a few short years out of enslavement. Here are some founders of some banks. Here are some bank stocks and bank certificates, Mutual Relief, Bounty, and Pension Association. National ex -Life. Again, we created uh, penny institutions. We created banks. We created insurance companies. The Atlanta uh, insurance Insurance company still exists to this day. It was created long, long time ago. Again, we issued stock, we issued insurance uh, policies. Those people during Reconstruction, I'll argue anybody, were some of the most innovative, were some, some of the most pioneering, some of the most trailblazing, some of the toughest, baddest, greatest people that you will ever have met in your life. Here is a partial list. That's right, a partial list of black inventions and inventors, many of which took place shortly out of enslavement. Let me just take a look for one second at some of these dates. I'm looking here at a date of, let's see, 1899, baby buggy. So again, modern day stroller patterned after the baby buggy invented by W.H. Richardson, June 18th, 1899. Let's take a look here, um, a chamber commode, January 8th, 1897, 1892, clothes dryer, 1884, egg beater, 1867, elevator, 1882, electric lamp, Louis Latimer. Louis Latimer's grandfather, excuse me, his uncle, was a uh, Prince Hall Mason and very active on the Underground Railroad, Louis Latimer. Let's take a look here, the fire extinguisher, 1872. And we know that African people were in inventing during enslavement. We all know the saying that invention, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. Let's say that one more time. Necessity is the, is the mother of all invention. Now they tell me that the cotton gin was created by who? Eli Whitney. I don't know about you, but I think I can go out on a limb and say, Mr. Eli Whitney, probably wasn't picking too much cotton in his day. That's right. Eli Whitney, from what I understand, is a European man, Caucasian man. He is uh, considered the uh, inventor of the cotton gin. But I suspect that it was some engineering, some entrepreneuring, some ingenious black man or woman who actually developed the cotton gin. Again, Eli Whitney's hands weren't raw. Eli Whitney's hands weren't swollen. Eli Whitney's hands weren't bloody each and every night from the thorny bush of the cotton trees, the cotton plants, rather. Again, it was those African people who had uh, the need or the desire to create something that would make this process of picking cotton more uh, uh, easy, more uh, quick, more expeditious. And so without a doubt, we know that um, our people were considered um, property and property cannot file patents. I didn't say it, someone else said it. I'll, I'll tell you what someone else said. Someone else said the best invention, someone said, they said the only invention, but I won't go that far. Someone said the best invention that Europeans created was the patent office. Because they're at the patent office, you can change and rearrange, you can erase, delete, throw out, the names and rightful owners of some inventions. Uh, but we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about what is documented, what we do know. Again, J Standard here, 1891, 
patented the refrigerator, uh, the rolling pin, 1884. So many inventions right out of enslavement. You see the tricycle. Some of the things that we still use to this day were created by those industrious, revolutionary, strong black men and women right out of enslavement. Again, you listen to the Gist of Freedom radio show. You can find out more at Black HistoryUniversity.com. I am your host, Jamal Brown. Some call me Professor Jamal. Some call me Mr. Black 365. Black365.com is where you can find out more about me. This here is an illustration and a patent drawing for the ice cream scooper. That's right. You cannot go a day. I'll say it even more direct. You cannot go an hour without interacting, interfacing, exchanging, being a part of Black history. What do you mean, Jamal? You cannot go much time before you bump into, knock over, or find a need for an invention that someone of African descent, a black person in this country has created. The potato chip was created by a, a, a black man. Right out of enslavement. Some of the baddest men you'll ever see. Hiram Rebels, Joseph Rainey, Jefferson Long, Josiah Walls. Again, these are names that should be on the tongues, names that should be on the ears, names that should be on the minds of all people. This here is not only black history, this is American history. This is the, some of the first black members of Congress. Some of them born enslaved. Some of their backs, heads, legs, hands, bore the scars of the whipping post, bore the scars of cotton plants bore the scars of enslavement. Yet, their gumption, their intelligence, their drive, their wit, their oomph, their faith in family, their faith in God, allowed them to rise above their ranks and become elected politicians. Some of the first black members of US Congress right here, Hiram Rebels, Benjamin Turner, Robert Carlos DeLarge, Josiah Walls, Jefferson Long, Joseph Rainey, and Robert Elliott. Fantastic men with vision, with pride. Many of them were race men. Many of them are unknown in the way in which they should be known. One of the reasons why they were unknown, it was no accident, propaganda. Propaganda. Here are an example, we'll show some examples of political cartoons. These were posters and flyers, handbills that were distributed all throughout the countryside. There were those who sought to undo the gains that we were able to make shortly after enslavement. And so they began to put out hit pieces, put out propaganda, put out memes, if you will, put out just hate, showing, hey, look, we must not allow these individuals, individuals of African descent to rise to the levels of politics. So here you see images of uh, the depicting Congress and depicting um, uh, the law uh, uh, houses throughout the country and said black people would be standing up on chairs and, and fighting and arguing. Uh, we talked, they talked about us being illiterate, uh, unable to think, barely having intelligence above a mule or any other animal. And these were images that were propagated and put out, trying to disparage, trying to undo the rightful gains that we gained shortly after enslavement. Again, you can find more images like this if you type in your Google search, um, Reconstruction Era Politics or Reconstruction Era Politics uh, Propaganda. Another quick Just to Freedom question for you. I was going to call it a Jeopardy question, but it's not Jeopardy. Um, what movie was the first movie shown at the White House? 
What movie was the first movie shown at the White House? I do something called the Black 365 Knowledge Bowl. It's basically a Black History Jeopardy style quiz competition where teams of students answer a series of Black History questions for trophies and prizes and medals, awards, scholarships, or what have you. And this was one of the questions in my Knowledge Bowl. The first movie shown at the White House, I'll tell you, shown on the White House lawn by Woodrow Wilson, it was called Birth of a Nation. That's right. Birth of, the, birth of a Nation, a movie which is nothing but a propaganda piece promoting the Ku Klux Klan was the first movie produced, or first movie shown at the White House. Another thing that took place was the rise of the Klan during Reconstruction. Here is some more propaganda pieces, again, showing uh, 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 worse than slavery here in the middle here. Worse than, slave, worse than slavery is a black family man, woman, and child learning how to read. You see ABCs down here, and it was showing that uh, white people must come together. Uh, the white lead, KKK, must come together and put back those Africans back on to those plantations. We cannot allow the gains. So unfortunately, many of those politicians that I just showed in the previous slide were unable to fulfill their terms, rightfully duly elected terms, uh, they were ran out of Congress, ran out of the Senate, ran out of their elected positions uh, by uh, racists and, and folks that put forward this propaganda. We're fast forwarding now, but not too far, uh, to show and give honor, pay homage to this brother right here. His name is Ota Banga. Here it is, uh, here at the top, O-T-A, uh, B-E, N G I or B uh, N G A. I've also also seen it. He is from the Congo. Congo is a country in Central Africa, uh, one of the naturally uh, wealthiest parts on the planet Earth. A lot of gold, coltan, zinc, cobalt. Many of the parts and pieces that go inside of each and every one of our cell phones is found inside of the ground inside of the Congo. That is where this gentleman is from. He was a short individual. Some would call him a twa or a pygmy. Those are somewhat. Uh, Pygmy is somewhat of a derogative term, but uh, that's the most common term for again, a short person. He was a short brother. And unfortunately, this brother was kidnapped, brought to America, uh, enslaved after enslavement was over. I believe the year was 1904, if I'm not mistaken. 1904, I believe it was the World's Fair there in um, St. Louis. They had this brother on display as if he was a zoo animal at the World's Fair. Take it a step further, he was actually placed in a zoo. That's right, the Bronx Zoo was the home where this brother, well, it was the place this brother called home, unfortunately. They kept him in the monkey cage. I'm talking the same way that people would go uh, to a zoo expecting to find lions and tigers and bears and chimpanzees and what have you. They had this brother behind a cage for display and for the pleasure and, and, and amusement of all of those who paid the price to see him. They talked about him as being a human monkey. They talked about him as being, again, nothing more than an animal. This was a person. This man had a mother, had a father, had brothers, sisters. He was a person with thoughts, emotions, aspirations, hopes, feelings. Yet he was reduced after enslavement. You heard me right when I said 1904. He was paraded around as an animal, forced to carry around monkeys or what have you. The brother began to lose hope, began to despair, was depressed, saw no hope of him returning to his ancestral homeland. And unfortunately, this brother took his own life, borrowed a pistol and shot himself in the heart. Could not bear the pain, the pressure, the problem of being looked upon as nothing more than a mere animal. We're not gonna get into it on this episode, but in future episodes, we're gonna talk about vaudeville, we're gonna talk about blackface, we're gonna talk about minstrel shows. Again, what type of people, I ask, what type of people, I'm gonna go a little deeper, I'm trying not to get too worked up, but people who call themselves Christians, people who call themselves and profess to believe in God, how is it that people develop a God complex, develop a desire to be like God, and 
control, and in this case, enslave, abuse, punish, dictate, steer the lives of other people, people that you claim to hate? How is it that you steal their monuments? How is it that you steal those people? It's, 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 it's beyond me. Plain and simple to say, it's simply beyond me. But Oda Benga, a brother that each and every time I have the opportunity, I speak upon him with high regard and would like for people to recall him fondly and give him the honor that he deserves. Again, here are here is another image that I like to think of when I think of the Reconstruction era. Again, that is a time where many, many gains took place from African people. We made tremendous inventions. We made tremendous investments. There were Black Wall Street that happened a little bit later. Uh, Oklahoma, but there was not. There was more than just one so-called Black Wall Street. Again, there were plenty, plenty of places. Uh, you had Rosewood in Florida. You had a place in uh, North Carolina. A number of places in North Carolina. People were industrious. People were valiant. People were strong. People had gumption. People change and rearrange how they did things. Again, I was speaking with our producer a little bit earlier before the show, and we were comparing notes and building, and uh, she actually introduced the idea to me, the concept or the, the fact to me that there were some uh, narratives from former overseers after enslavement that said that uh, during enslavement, uh, some of their enslaved Africans, again, said that they were blind, said that they were crippled, said that they were crazy, uh, but, Soon as enslavement was over, these same people who literally said that they were blind were going around riding horses, going around uh, domesticating animals, going around tilling their own farms and what have you. Again, we constantly struggled, we constantly fought against, we constantly pushed against uh, uh, the horrible institution, the wretched institution of enslavement. And then we, we got some act right, if you will. We, we got ourselves together as soon as enslavement was over and we can do for ourselves, work our own land, develop our own families. Again, African people are some phenomenal, phenomenal people. Let me stop that share. Um, there are some more images that I'm looking for right now on my computer of some of just the greatness that we had. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go here, share my screen there. Again, we uh, interacted with this photo already. Again, it's the ice cream scooper. If you had your scoop of ice cream with your with your uh, sweet potato pie or peach cobbler, again, you can thank this brother right here. Uh, Entrepreneur Spirit of African American Inventors. We have here in the, the center, Mr. Lonnie Johnson. Uh, he was the creator of the Super Circle. Yes, this is far after uh, uh, Reconstruction, but again, we're just showing the genius of African people. Uh, brother went to an HBCU. Brother Lonnie Johnson worked for NASA. Brother Lonnie Johnson, again, created the Super Soaker for several, several years. That has been one of the top 20 toys around the planet. Uh, Hasbro, the uh, parent company that produced and manufactured that toy, uh, a few years ago uh, had a, a ruling go against them by a, I believe it was a federal judge that said that they misappropriated some royalties. And I believe it was some of, of the tune of Someone is going to have to correct me out there in the chat or uh, what have you, but I want to say it was 50 million. Something in me is telling me that it was actually more than that. Let's look at this. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Has Royal Burrow plus Lonnie Johnson royalties. While I'm looking that up, again, you're listening to the Gist of Freedom radio show, 73. $73 million in royalties. November 2013, Johnson was awarded nearly $73 million in royalties by Hasbro in arbitration for the Super Soaker. Again, we are some intelligent people. We are some amazing people and we do some amazing things. Again, a uh, black man invented the street sweeper. Black man invented the hole punch. There are so many, so many, so many inventions that are people introduced to the world. What we call black history truly is the missing pages of world history. I'll say that one more time. Write it down, take a picture, remember it. You can use it. You can tell people that you came up with it. Well, something I often like to say is what we call black history truly is the missing pages of world history. 
there is no history in this country, if it were not for the amazing history of our, uh, let's take a look here. Again, they're all black towns in Tulsa, uh, not only in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but so many other places, Marshalltown, uh, Tullahuse, uh, Canadian colored, North Fork colored, Arkansas colored, again, early African towns. Many of us, again, were being brutalized in, in, excuse me, were being brutalized in the South. And so we sought to uh, leave the South, many of us did, there was, they call it the Dust Bowl and all sorts of things when we left in mass from Kansas and we left in mass from other places um, to going west in search of freedom. I'm gonna share another photo real fast here with you. Let me come here, come here. Again, we talked about Ethiopia earlier as being a place that was never colonized. I believe this is on your screen here. We're seeing brothers and sisters inside of rock-hewn churches. That's right, rock-hewn. These are pure, solid rock that was carved out by individuals of African descent, and we had churches inside of them. Many of those churches still exist to this day, places like Lalibela and other places in, in Ethiopia. You can take a trip and go and see and touch these rock hewn churches where we, our brothers and sisters from Ethiopia, again, withstood the tests of colonization and never at one time were forced to have the flag of a colonizing country flown above their land. Um, again, you're listening to the Just of Freedom radio show. I am your host, Jamal Brown. We're winding down the conversation here. Um, we're going to talk about just a couple more inventions. It comes, something that just comes to the top of my mind. Again, Louis Latimer is a creator of the light bulb, um, creator of the carbon light filament. He's the actual patent holder. Some of us think, uh, if you're like me, uh, first of the month comes around, you have to pay an Edison bill. I often wonder, why don't we pay the Latimer bill? Thomas Edison, as you know, is one that is uh, most thought of when we think of the light bulb. Thomas Edison, in fact, did create a light bulb. However, his light bulb uh, wouldn't last more than about 12 and a half hours. Imagine having to change your light bulb about twice a day. That's what it really boils down to. Uh, it's more, more than about 12 and a half hours uh, was, was the length of time in which Thomas Edison's light bulb lasted. So what happened was that uh, when he couldn't figure out the mathematics behind the light bulb, he hired a team of young inventors. Louis Latimer was the youngest and only African-American to be invited. And again, it was his contributions to the light bulb that gives us the lights that we have today. What we call black history truly is world history. Um, wanted to go back to um, Seneca Village. Uh, Seneca Village was a all black village, in, excuse me, all black town, uh, all black space in New York and it was raised, it was taken to the ground uh, so that what we know at Central Park could be established. Again, you listen to the Just a, uh, Just a Freedom Radio Show. I am your host, Jamal Brown. I wanna see if our producer would like to chime in um let me unmute her unmute her you are unmuted okay let's see all right all right i wasn't ready but oh i'm sorry like share. <laughs> sherry yeah uh let's see you're you looking to share your screen yes um let me just give you permission how do i do it working out some technical things here mm-hmm. So well, while we're working out the technical things, um, I wanted to backtrack on Binga. Yes. Binga also was uh, helped out by some church members. Is that right? Um, we had a gentleman by the name of uh, Gordon, and I no longer want to share. Oh, okay. Have a conversation. Okay. And so Gordon and a, a woman who started an orphanage home out of her house in New York City. 
uh, they were the ones who rescued Venga. Wow. There was a bunch of clergy, I mean, um, they took care of um, Venga, so I thought that was important. And, um, you know, you're doing a phenomenal job. I don't want to slow the pace. <laughs> you have a lot of energy. Thank you, yeah, I was on fire. Yes, you are. <laughs> so, you know, we just want to go over the different ways that um, monuments, including people, have been stolen. And why is it necessary for um, these sort of people to maintain the names like towns, Mawa, Native American names? So I'll let you expand on it. Okay, as we're looking to wrap up here. Yes, uh, as our illustrious scholar and producer said, uh, it's, it's not only our right, but our responsibility to know, read, research, understand, uh, and teach the uh, illustrious history that we have um, to regain cupcakes. regain and hold on to the uh, names and of, of the individuals and of the places uh, that we established. Again, know um, the name um, J.B. Stratford. J.B. Stratford, he was one of the most pioneering and most um, Industrious men. I, I've known I said those two words a number of times in this show, but he was again a fantastic brother in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the early 1900s. He had a two-story, uh, multi-story uh, hotel with uh, marble staircases and what have you. Again, it's important that we know the names of these individuals, know the names of the towns and the cities and the uh, uh, parishes that we established and maintained. Some of us still hold on. Uh, our family, through our family's lineage to some of the lands that we were able to acquire. And it's important because land is the basis of all freedom. I'll say that one more time. This is an ancient African saying, but land is the basis of all freedom or all power. So it's important that we understand the lands in this country that we establish and look to regain some of that land. Uh, 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 living the city life, living the fast life isn't always the best thing, especially when you can't um, feed yourself. We need land in order to establish a, um, a, a, a home base, plant food, and uh, feed yourself and your people. We're, again, we're almost wrapping up here. One more note about Odabanga. There's a historical marker in the state of Virginia which honors him. Again, honoring our brothers and sisters is certainly important. In an upcoming show, we are going to have a show done by me um, uh, where I will be discussing my top five, I'm thinking about top five, maybe we can go top seven, monuments that I would like to see. This day and age, we're talking about monuments uh, of Confederates coming up and going down and being destroyed or being replaced. We're talking about uh, U.S. military bases that, bo bo that bear the name of actual traitors to this country. And uh, I'm just going to reimagine, if you will, I'm going to take you along with me, reimagining the uh, changing of some names or the establishing of some national monuments. I'm going to give you my at least top five, I might do top seven, I'll throw a few bonus ones in there, of uh, statues that I would like to see erected in these United States, uh, honoring the individuals of African descent who have made great contributions to our people and to this country. Well, our time has been well spent here. It was another fantastic show. We are stepping up the technology a little bit here at the Gist of Freedom. Uh, bear with us as we get through a few technical things. We're going to make it more smooth, more interactive each and every time. Um, be on the lookout. I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all those who have listened to this, all those who will listen to this. Please like, share, subscribe, uh, join the podcast family, tell a friend. Um, come on down to the next episode of Gist of Freedom radio show. It has been my pleasure. I'm honored to be with you. Your host. Jamal Brown, thank you very much. Peace.